Aloha, and welcome to Figments, the Power of Ima Imagination. I'm Dan Leaf, as you know, I hope, I go by Fig. And uh, in this show, we examine ideas and dreams that are brought to fruition. At least that's the concept. Today's show is going to be a little bit different because as I envision this show, this is going to be a human interest uh, story about the partners and enablers we left behind in Afghanistan and the chaotic evacuation. And we know they're very much at risk and the concerns. All of us certainly have worked with partners and enablers throughout our career. And after the withdrawal, uh, much has been written and said about them. The idea for the show came from a connection with a fighter pilot buddy of mine whose son-in-law is an Army soldier, uh, has been an Army soldier, enlisted and officer, retired lieutenant colonel now. And uh, he taught me a lot about this and made me think more broadly about the importance of how the United States interacts with and respects our partners and enablers. So I'd like to welcome Lieutenant Colonel re Retired Jeff Chase. Aloha, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing well, Dan. Thanks. How are you? Great. Hey, thanks for joining me on this. As I said, you've taught me a lot. And I know this will be a, a detailed discussion, but before we get to that, uh, I think viewers always like to know a little bit about who they're hearing from, and they know plenty about me. So tell me a bit about your career your or your life, your roots. And I'll ask you about your career then. So where are you from, son? Well, I uh, born and raised Texan, Dan. Um, so I grew up here and uh, and was really thankful to be able to return here after retirement. So, um, yeah, just finished up a 23 years uh, career with the U.S. Army, and uh, really unique experience. Got a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things along the way. Obviously, we're we're finishing up a very interesting time in our nation's history, and uh, you know, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, however you you prefer to look at it. Um, it was all on the front row seat there uh, to some really historical events that our uh, our nation's been in. So, yeah, I'm just now transitioning and trying to figure out what's next. And uh, back to Texas, are you a Cowboys fan? I am diehard. I'm a Green Bay native. That probably makes you mad, but uh, <laughs> who knows what this season's going to be like. So you grew up in Texas working on your grandpa's farm, I think you told me, and your grandfather was a big influence. I've got a photo here of him, your mom, and one of her three sisters. Tell me why your grandfather influenced you to, to have a life of service to our country. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I grew up working some of the uh, summers um, spent there on his farm that he had out in the hill country of Texas. And, uh, and it was just a lot of quality time working on various projects with him where we would just get to talking about a lot of things. And, and one thing that just always really came through to me was uh, his sense of service. And, uh, and I used to ask him from a really young age, you know, what got him in the military, why that happened. And, and of course, he was coming in on the, on the tail of, you know, the greatest generation in the World War II. And mm -hmm. he had siblings that, uh, that fought in World War II. Um, but his sense of service, I was really drawn to that. And, uh, and so he was just always a positive influence. I always looked up to, uh, to him and his experience and, uh, and wondered if I would have a chance at that one day. And your chance came when uh, you were attending school after high school and found it about as inspiring as I did, not very. And you decided to enlist as a soldier in the Army, right? I did. I um, think things were going nowhere fast, and I, uh, I was lacking a little bit of direction. And it just occurred to me um, that, hey, if there was ever a time where um, I've got nothing else on the schedule right now, and, uh, and I'd like to explore this further and and see what this is about. And if it's for me, um, that time is now. And so I did, I enlisted and uh, man, I was just so much better for it. I have never once regretted that. It was a it was a really great informative time in my life. Yeah, I can't imagine what I would have, uh, what my life would have been like without the direction that the Air Force gave me. And uh, I'm a poli-sci major, so I shouldn't speculate about what an object in motion without direction is, but I had lots of motion and no direction. So uh, I'm sure somebody can explain that concept in scientific terms. I've got a great picture of you here with your 113 armored vehicle. Um, and uh, where was that taken, that picture? Oh, I think that was a training exercise, probably at the National Training Center in Southern California. So uh, it looked pretty yeah. desert-like. Uh, and of course, soldiers spend a lot of time out at NTC. And it's pretty dusty. And that's uh, what I remember from all my time with the Army is a Ford Air Controller and 
your liaison officer and later um, on going into Iraq is dust and dirt and dust and dirt. Exactly. It's, a, it's a gritty life. So you were picked for a, what's called a green to gold scholarship where you go from the enlisted ranks, get your college degree, and then um, become an officer commissioned as a lieutenant. How were you chosen? To, you know, if you were without direction, uh, what what made you somebody the army would choose to uh, send to school and make an officer? Did that happen? Well, I'm not sure exactly what all they saw, but I was, you know, I was stationed there at Fort Hood, and I was in a uh, recon unit. Um, that 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 was my my job at the time, and um, and my squad leader and platoon sergeant and platoon leader that the entire platoon leadership they just brought me in one day and said, hey, we. We think you've got future potential, but we're basically split right down the middle on whether you'd make a better NCO or a better officer. So we're going to throw that over to you and uh, and let let that be more of your decision. So what do you think? And um, and at that point, you know, it's probably one of the first times I thought that uh, uh, I actually thought about the future in, in those types of terms. Um, and I definitely wasn't some strategic visionary that was plotting and planning right. my move at the time. I was. I was trying to be the best Mark 19 gunner I could be and, and, and all the time, you know, at those things. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I did, I put some thought into it. And, and honestly, I think, I think the choice uh, is drawn as I was to the, the unbelievable quality of NCOs that I had at the time. Um, I felt like I might be able to do more good and impact more people uh, from the uh, vantage point of an officer. So it really wasn't a, a, uh, a vertical, I, I guess it, right for me as much as it was just a level or span of influence and uh, just based on the things i had seen i thought i might be able to impact more that's uh that's a really interesting point when you first said that your leadership was debating your suitability to be a non-commissioned officer a sergeant or uh, an officer a commission officer i my mind immediately went to uh, the notion that that is not a vertical choice and it's not a qualitative choice, uh, as some might think, that right. uh, are the, who haven't served in the military. Uh, some people are ideally suited to NCO leadership, not because they're lesser in any way, but because they're ideally suited to that situation and that mode of leadership. Uh, so um, interesting. So they sent you to Texas Tech, right? Yes, so I was accepted to tech uh, at their ROTC department, and so I went there and, and finished out the remainder of my schooling. Uh, I had that one quality year, if you remember, right out of high school, so I, ha I had to add a little bit more. And yeah, right. <laughs> so I, uh, I finished up the schooling there, and I commissioned in, uh, in August of 2000. Well, Jeff, I don't, uh, frankly, in my education, I don't remember a quality year. I, I remember getting by, but, but if you had a quality year, good for you. You got more than a degree at Texas Tech. I did. That's where I uh, I met my lovely bride, Lauren, and uh, and so yeah, it, it it ended up being just one of the most positive experiences I think I of my life. And you got commissioned. Uh, that had to be quite a feeling. I, that I do remember when the gold bars were pinned down. We've got a picture of you with your grandpa when you got your jump wings. What was that moment like? I tell you the uh, so I you know I I commissioned into the uh, intelligence business but uh, but I was branch detailed into the infantry so my first few years would be spent in the infantry and uh, and so I went from Texas Tech I served a little bit of time as a as a gold bar recruiter waiting for my school slot to come mm, up right um, there you know and helping helping out around there um, and then I went to Fort Benning Georgia and uh, and started the litany of schools that you go through uh, to prep you for a, a career as an infantry officer and. Um, and airborne is just one of several and, uh, and my grandfather was airborne and, uh, and he and my mom actually drove down and, uh, and were there when I made my final two jumps and, uh, oh, wow. and pin his wings on me. And that was a really, really special time that they got to actually watch me jump. And, and, you know, you could tell he always missed it. And, um, and there were some, some aspects that he was super happy to, to leave behind and, and some aspects that he really uh, missed. And I think um, he's always enjoyed being connected uh, through me back to Kanai. So how, how is it now that, you know, it's been so long since I left it? And, and that was just one of those occasions where he got to go reconnect with a place that he was stationed, with a school that he had wow. been through and whatnot. And it was pretty special. And fortunately, your shoot up in both times, that would have been miserable. But, there you uh, go. There you go. The, uh, for those who don't have military roots or haven't served with the infantry in the field like I have, um, we get a lot of thank you for your service 
never really know how to answer that uh, other than to say I got more than I gave. But let me just say to the viewers who haven't lived it, the infantry life is a hard life. It is. Um, Even in peacetime. Early is worth. <laughs> yeah, and uh, hopefully as an airborne guy, your knees are in good shape and all that, but that's not the topic of the discussion today. Uh, but thanks for all you did for our country and for the world. Uh, so you're commissioned, you're branch detailed. I, if we had three or four hours, I might be able to explain the intricacies of army uh, professional utilization, how you go back and forth that we don't, I won't. Um, but in your career, commission career, you served infantry, then focused on intelligence, but also got into the special operations world. How did the transition to special ops go? Well, I, my first duty station was at Fort Carson, Colorado, and, uh, and that's where I did my infantry uh, platoon leading time and whatnot. Um, and after, when it was time to transition um, to the MI world, military intelligence, um, I just went up to brigade and uh, so, so my higher headquarters, and, uh, and that was my first iteration um, you know, as an intelligence officer. I, I did a quick turn and burn course to teach me enough to make me dangerous. And uh, and then you know took took over a a fairly substantial leadership spot up at the brigade S two, um, S two intelligence. Sorry. Yeah, sorry the uh, the staff section right. Um, and then after doing that, um, I I was in a kind of a counseling session with the division uh, senior intelligence officer on post, and uh, and he said, hey, you've you've had a, a pretty interesting go already. Um, is there anything else you'd like to do? And I said, I'd really like to go across the street there um, on the other side of post and see if the uh, 10th Special Forces Group would have me. And he goes, you know what, if, uh, if they'll have you and they'll say yes, then you've got my blessing. So I did. I walked over there and it turns out they were, they were ramping up. I didn't know it at the time for the Iraq invasion. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so a series of conversations uh, led, to, uh, led to them saying yes. And, uh, and so I walked over there. So that, that was my first exposure to the special operations world. Still a uh, still a first lieutenant at the time, which was quite the anomaly. I think their I think their task organization has changed a lot over the past twenty years, and I think mm -hmm. that's not such a weird thing. But at the time, um, I was the only one, and uh, and they made that known. <laughs> yeah, you were a kid, uh, though you were a kid who had enlisted time. That had to help a little bit in terms of not being too wet behind the ears. Not a typically wet. Got me through the door. Not really about it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so you served during the Iraq invasion. I was, as I told you, with General McKiernan as his senior Air Force representative on his staff uh, during the invasion. I'm pretty sure I still have dust in, somewhere in me <laughs> from that man. That, that was unique dust. You can, simply couldn't keep it out of anything. And then, and then on to special ops. And what, what all did you, with, within the limits of classification, what all did you do as a special ops intelligence officer? Well, really the, the, that first you know, couple of deployments um, with 10th Special Forces Group actually was, uh, it, you know, it was part of the broader task force Viking um, that mm -hmm. whole control of the North. And so that was our, our area uh, of responsibility was to watch the Northern half of Iraq. And so obviously that was, um, it had to have a lot of partner engagement in that and the Kurds. Uh, up just north of the green zone, the the KDP, um, mm -hmm. the PKA, those those you might remember some of those uh, those partners Absolutely. really got a front row seat to partner engagement. And hey, there's there's a lot more people on a battlefield than mm -hmm. I realized, you know, just from reading books and and whatnot. And so that really was my first exposure um, to not only how many players you find on a battlefield and and what the competing agendas and 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 whatnot lead to, but uh, but more the value that they bring and, and how, um, I guess, unbelievably impactful um, deliberate relationships can be for good or bad. And, um, and in, in Northern Iraq, you were, uh, there wasn't a large U.S. force presence up there early in the war, right? Was, oh, they, uh, they, they ended up calling us a uh, Joint Special Operations Task Force or just sort of uh, north. Yep. And so it was us against uh at, when we when we first got in there was uh we were facing three iraqi corps i believe and that was roughly or as a big unit uh, folks it was about it was about 1500 versus thirty five thousand, i believe was the the numbers i remember yeah wow and so you're kind of on your own and uh absolutely on your own without partners and enablers and we're going to talk about the partners and enablers in a minute but first let me take a break to talk about figments on reality 
uh, coming up on September 13th at 10 o'clock uh, Hawaii Standard Time, and it will be available on YouTube afterwards. I'm going to talk, uh, continue to talk national security uh, to go with my three episodes directly related to Afghanistan. I'm going to talk national security, the Washington problem. It will still be non-political, as I always am, but I think we've got a problem uh, with the Washington national security community that can be addressed. So hopefully I'll offer a solution. So Jeff, back to our topic on partners and enablers and friends and colleagues, eventually they become at times. Uh, first of all, I've never flown a combat mission without partners because uh, my combat missions were over Iraq, kind of limited, and then over Serbia, Kosovo, uh, less limited, but always with not just U.S. Army and, or Air Force and Army, Navy, Marine, aviation units involved, but also NATO or, or other coalition partners. So I didn't go to war without them. And in my work in the Pacific, I know that across this vast expanse, we don't do anything without attempting to uh, build our partnerships. And right now, as a matter of fact, there's, there are uh, significant efforts to expand both the quantity and quality of our partnerships. Um, and in my experience, uh, we don't always fully respect our partners. We kind of treat them as add-ons. We, you know, we have the typical American hubris, which is very dangerous. Uh, in your case, what did your partners and enablers do? Talk, talk about what that means to be a partner or enabler to American forces in peace and war. Well, like you said, I don't think people have a full appreciation um, for just how much partner involvement just exists. And that can be on a training standpoint, you know, the, that NTC rotation, there were partners there that, you know, as that young private chase was seeing, um, there are, um, there are partners in every activity period and, and whether you realize it or not, and sometimes they're unilateral, you know, with, within the U.S. apparatus, but partner nations are just such a big, uh, a big part of uh, what it is that we do. And I think one of, the, one of the biggest values that they bring is a local or regional perspective. And it's just a lens that we're not familiar with. And uh, the idea that we could go into a location, um, you, you know, and, and understand the nuances, uh, whether or not you understand a language or not. I mean, the, the, if you think about the nuances <laughs> of slang and dialects and and cultural uh, isms across various, you know, subregions. You know, we we can we can point to things like the Middle East. It's like, well, there's so many subregions. Asia, Middle East, yeah, exactly. And so those things, um, you don't have a full appreciation until you get up close and personal. And then as you start to build those bonds, build those relationships with partners on the ground, you quickly see um, how important their opinion and their insight is. And so, yeah, I, I don't know of anything that I ever did that wasn't enabled by a partner in some uh, direct or indirect way. So if you're getting that insight, and I had an interesting career with a or conversation with an active duty four star a couple of weeks ago talking about Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And he said that one of the mistakes we made in Afghanistan was not understanding what the Afghans want. And, and, and that's one of the nuances of, of partner engagement. And if you simply treat it as what you get from your partners as data, you get maybe half the value. If you take it as insight and perspective that you don't share but have to appreciate and respect, then you might get some value from more value from it. Would you agree with that assessment? I would. And I, and I, you know, in, in talking to a lot of junior officers, uh, you know, we've been doing this a long time. So you obviously, as you grow up and you and you get further along in the ranks and and whatnot, there's a lot of people coming behind you that you want to instill some of these lessons that you've learned. And junior officers, junior NCOs, yeah, it didn't matter. Everybody that was ever sent to work with me, um, that's one of the first things you you have to get through and make sure they have a, a better understanding for. Is this is that the partner perspective is not something that you have to put up with. It's not something that you mm. have to It's something that you have to appreciate and you have to put yourself in their shoes or else what you find yourself doing is you're talking past competing definitions of success or competing definitions of time. 
and uh, competing risk tolerances. And if you if you don't take the time to deliberately understand that lens um, and, and ask the questions, they I've never yet met a partner that did not want to have a meaningful discussion on how they could get closer aligned um, in terms of, hey, this, this is the plan. How are we going to do this thing that we've been called to do? They all want to do that. And um, they can sense it when you feel like you're having to put up with them rather than fully appreciate their perspective. And it, it's easy to do at times because uh, we tend to be the most technologically sophisticated. Uh, sometimes we're um, taking a bit more risk. A, a story from the uh, Serbia operate, air uh, campaign over Serbia was we had Afghan partners at my, or I'm sorry, NATO partners at my base and their national leadership who wouldn't let them fly offensive sorties or would only let them fly patrol sorties, combat air patrol, uh, and not engage targets directly. Um, they were still an important contribution because those are combat air patrols we didn't have to fill. And uh, it was easy, it could have been easy to disrespect them because they weren't getting shot at, frankly, which is a big discriminator in combat, who's getting shot at and who's not wasn't their fault. And even if they had chosen at the squadron level to do it, they're still contributing and it is what it is. And uh, frankly, uh, one of the best perspectives they had was that they were Europeans and we were fighting in Europe. And right. I don't know if you noticed, but I'm not a European. <laughs> and um, so there, it's it can be easy to default to uh, sort of a... Uh, condescending view of others who aren't doing the same things you're doing. And, and that's at your own peril, it seems to me. How important are partners and enablers to our missions? You said they're always there. I, do, would you, on a 10 scale, uh, where would you rate partner uh, enablement, engagement? Easily a nine and a half. I mean, it, it, they, yeah. you can't do things without them. So Everywhere that you go, everything that we're going to do, you, you have to have uh, somebody's permission. You have to have somebody's concurrence. Um, and if it's a location that you don't have that or you don't need it, that means really bad things are about to happen. I mean, you are in all out conflict if you are if you are violating those rules. So if you think mm -hmm. about, you know, hey, I'm going to go to a different geographic place on Earth and do this thing. Um, there's a lot of phone calls. That are going to need to be made to make sure that people understand number one that you know we can protect our own forces um you know force protection is is absolutely and security is, is the number one priority when you go anywhere and do anything and we can't keep our troops safe um if we don't have the partners that are involved and and spearheading the 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 biggest thing though is you know that i i envision this the idea that we're going and we have a thing and it's it's way down the road. There's so many bends in that road before we get to what our definition of success is. And really, right. I think the partners just provide uh, a, um, a that critical look around the next bend when we don't even realize there's a bend in the road coming up. It's like from our we can only see with our technology or our defense budgets or whatnot. There's only so much that we can see without the enablement of a no kidding local perspective. And they help us see around those corners and they help us anticipate problems that we would have never realized that we were about to have. And you, um, you can't understand, you can't make a good determination of success, as you said earlier, if you don't understand what their notion of success was. And right. as we got ready for this, we spoke about time. Um, our presence, especially in combat operations, but folks, let me tell you that the same concepts we're talking about are just as true for uh, for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief or any other in military endeavor around the world. That it, it doesn't have to be uh, when the bullets are flying. But that that notion of time, we're temporary. We see an end. Our Afghan friends right now. It, don't have an end, and what's ahead doesn't look good for our partners and enablers. They're they're going to be stuck with whatever le we leave, and if our definition of success is <laughs> stops on date certain, um, that's not their success, even if they're compatible. Agree? 
I do. And, um, and we have to remember that we aren't all of the vote. We get one vote of many. And, uh, and you know this all too well, Dan. It's uh, it, the idea that what we do and that decision, um, the, the, the decisions that we make within our perspective and our agendas and our definitions, uh, the idea that it doesn't affect the partners and, and the ripples in the pond go in all directions, that it doesn't affect other people, it's, it, it's just wrong. And um, it, it does affect our partners. And we have to make sure that that's the collaborative nature of the discussions that got us to there, uh, to the event and made us successful to whatever varying degree, we have to remember that same level of collaboration uh, is absolutely critical um, when we're going to figure out how to end it, terminate it, stall it, change its name, mm -hmm. reclassify it, whatever it is, yeah. however, the dismount, how do we get off this bull after eight seconds? It, that, it's a group discussion, it's a team sport. And, um, and I've, I'm just seeing a concerning trend that we're not, we're not necessarily respecting the team sportness at that, uh, at that, those final stages. And it's, it's really going to affect us long-term if we don't watch that. Because it is because, uh, partnering is something that we typically have done better than other nations. And we can't do everything ourselves. We ought not seek to do everything ourselves because it's impossible. So that would be, that would be a fool's errand, but, um, when we compare ourselves to other uh, powers like China and Russia, uh, we have generally been good at partnerships. And if we lose that advantage, uh, we'll have a more difficult time being a force for good, which I really believe, despite the difficult, the terrible events of the last few weeks, we continue to seek to be. We don't always do it. Jeff, I'd like to talk about one other element of this partnership that you mentioned earlier, and that's language. Uh, I speak one language, I can get by, uh, I can be cordial in several others of places I've served generally. Um, be, but I think there's a natural bias uh, to be dismissive of people whose English isn't perfect when you're a native English speaker. And it's hard work to communicate with partners and enablers when you don't share a common original language, first language. Uh, how important do you think it is to work through the difficulty of translation, understanding, truly understanding, not just translating? Uh, how, how key is language in all of this? I don't think it can be overstated, the importance of it. Um, I mean, some of those most uh, critical early victories in the, uh, in the Iraq invasion, rather, um, they, were, they were decided on languages that we we didn't realize that we had, but you get there and you, um, you think you're going to go in and, hey, we need this type of linguist or this type of dialect. And you get there and realize actually the guys we need to partner with, um, they actually speak a little something different. Right. I figure out, okay, so between the two of us here, what, uh, what do we have? And so I'll just say that that was a little surprising uh, what languages ended up being used for planning a lot of those uh, initial operations. But um, it, it can't be overstated. I mean, and, and that I think... I think a lot of people have made that. I was at a conference one time with uh, Heckman Karzai, and he was commenting on that exact thing. And, and he was he was very underwhelmed at this conference uh, at that point in the war. This was probably 08, 09 ish, um, with the lack of investment in language uh, that he saw from his U.S. counterparts, uh, from primarily the diplomatic uh, level. But it, interesting, it, it, yeah. Yeah, it's it's important. It's time consuming, and as you know, in uh, in combat, there is nothing more precious than time. It's always compressed and uh, you're on the clock, but you, you, can't, there, the, you can't take a shortcut with language and understanding. And in air combat, we used to, uh, used to have a cliche, take your time and get there faster. And if you, you've got to do that with language. And speaking of time, holy cow, this went by quick. And I really appreciate your insight. Got a nice picture of you and your bride. We pinned on uh, Lieutenant Colonel. I think that's a Washington Monument behind me, if my landmark or behind you, if a, my landmark recognition is correct. So again, I want to thank you for your insight. I wish we had more time. Perhaps we'll talk again uh, some other time. I'm sure we will. Um, but it's been very helpful, Jeff. So th thanks for your service and and thanks for teaching me. Thanks for having me, Dan. This has been a lot of fun. 
You bet. And no, he's in the army, so he calls me Dan. Nobody in the Air Force calls me Fig. They're a little more formal than we are. So um, reminder, folks, figs, figments on reality, national security, the Washington problem coming up on September 13th at 10 o'clock Hawaii Standard Time. I'd like to thank Think Tech Hawaii for being the platform for these shows. Like me, they're a nonprofit. We don't do this for money. We're citizen journalists, and we'd appreciate your support of Think Tech Hawaii if you'd like to donate. But also check out their website because they have shows about mm, everything. You'll find a lot interesting there from other citizen journalists. So thanks for watching. Figments, the power of imagination. Aloha. <laughs>